I, I think, I mean, firstly, that there's a, there's a difference between dry eye disease and dry eye symptoms. Um, some people can have dry eye symptoms, which is not actually due to dry eye disease. Um, from a practitioner point of view, it's important to listen to what the patients are saying to try and figure things out. I mean, you know, lots of people do have dry eye disease, but you've got to listen, you've got to ask the appropriate questions. Um, and you've also got to make sure you've got the appropriate assessment in place. Um, things like not having the correct spectacle prescription in place will can lead to dry eye symptoms. Um, so you, you've got to make sure that the basics are there. For us, with particularly new patients who have searched us out um, with specific symptoms, we will send them a questionnaire um, so that we can get a good gauge of where they are. Um, we ask them to bring along their drops, uh, ask them what they're doing at the moment to find out where they are on their journey. Because as with Claire, it, it is a journey and you've got to, you, you know, you don't want to repeat things that maybe have not worked, but you also want to make sure that the basics are being done because it is a very structured approach to management um, as far as we're concerned. Yeah, so I think um, with the advent of TFOS and, and TFOS Qs2 in particular, what was really great was they gave a nice structured um, view into diagnosis and management of dry eye. And this, for me as a clinician, is fantastic because it, because it puts everyone on the same page. You know, it says this is what the science has shown to be validated. So we use something called an OSDI, um, Ocular Surface Disease Index, and it is about 13 questions. And the nice thing about it is it all it wants you to do is think about the last week. It's not asking you to think about months in the past. And as you think about things in the last week, hopefully, you know, it makes it easier to answer those questions. And it will ask you things about in which environments you are having problems, when you are doing specific tasks, um, are you having specific problems? usually involves us having to avert the lid. So you may have seen it in schools where little kids do things like that, but we will do that for you, top and bottom, um, just to see the quality of, of the glands. And then we will assess the, what they're expressing. So whether they are there, so functionally are they there, structurally are they there, sorry, I should say, and then functionally, what are they producing? We will also put in what we call um, staining dyes, so there's one called lysamine green, which will stain dead cells, and one called sodium fluorescine, which stains damaged cells. And all of this data together, when we put this cake together, let's call these in ingredients of a cake, once we've got all the ingredients, we can then start to look at making informed decisions about management um, that we think will be of, of most benefit. Uh, to the patient sitting in the chair. Interestingly, it's all very structured. So we, we do talk about a lot of the same things. Um, and a big part of what we do is education. Because as you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm reading through the questions, you know, a lot of it, and I, I sometimes I don't think people quite appreciate how chronic dry eye disease can be. And it's that chronicity of it, that makes it can, be, can, can cause a huge impact uh, on your life and your day-to-day -day well-being. Um, so we, you know, we take our time. It's an hour and a half appointment. Uh, we make sure that we've got all the information before we just start you know, just throwing artificial tears at it, which 10 years ago is probably what we would have done because we didn't really know much about dry eye disease. So we share everything with the patient. Um, you know, if so, as as a medical professional, you use these clinical terms like blepharitis, you know, based in Latin, um, and conjunctivitis. To the general public, that potentially means absolutely zero. 
okay? They've sat with you for an hour and a half. You've done all of these tests. If you then just fire a diagnosis at them um, and ask them to do something, they may do it for a little bit. Um, but like I said, it's chronic. So they, you know, the patient needs to understand why they're doing it. And what we have found um, is that if you can show people what is happening, you know, show them how, um, what their eyes are doing, they tend to have a better understanding and then they're able to manage it better. They're more engaged in the management because they know that if I say use drops that taking the drops for a week on and off is not going to be enough. You know, I mean, the latest study that I just saw, you know, you need to do at least four times a day for a month for any kind of sym symptomatic relief. And it takes about three months for that to show in terms of um, signs on, uh, on the patient. And it's little things like that. And patients want to learn. They like, they like learning, you know. Um, they feel more empowered about what is going on uh, and what they can do to help themselves because ultimately they have to help themselves. I think, I mean, we're very lucky. People tend to look, look out for us and we, and we have a special interest in it. I think... It'd be rude of me to say who's good and who's bad. Um, but I think you get an indication of how much interest a practitioner has in dry eye uh, based on, on the way they've done the assessment. What have they measured? You know, have they measured non-invasive breakup time um, rather than invasive breakup time? Have they looked at your glands? You know, have they spoken to you about your medication? Um, or your glasses, when was the, the last time you had your glasses updated? Um, you know, there are some professionals out there who are amazing and they do amazing things with minimal kit, I would say. Um, but that comes from decades, decades of experience. So if they look as young as I do and they're just using a white light, I'd, I'd, I'd be curious as to, to what, how they're investigating you. But the real question is ask them questions. You know, are they supportive? Do they listen? Or are they just talking at you? Because, you know, whether they're a professor of ophthalmology or a newly qualified optometrist, um, you know, with dry eye, what we have found is a lot of the time our patients want to be listened to and just just need someone to just hear what they're saying and I think that has a huge impact on the relationship that you have with your practitioner and it's good to have a relation you need a good relationship with your practitioner because you know they're going to be telling you things that science may say is the latest thing and you have to trust in it and depending on where you are in the country where you are in the world this can have um, financial burden you know, this can have financial impact, uh, cost impact. So find someone you trust, find someone who's prepared to answer your questions, uh, take a bit of time, you know, if you drop them an email, not all the time in the middle of the night emails, but if you drop them an email that they're prepared to, you know, take the time to reply uh, and they're keeping on top of the, you know, the most up-to-date um, techniques and management that are available. You, you know, if you're talking to someone and you're telling them stuff and they're like, never heard of that, never heard of that, never heard of that. Or even I'm not prepared to do any of those. You might want to think about taking a sidestep. And that might be away from me or Brian as well. I'm not saying we are amazingly infallible. There has to be a relationship there. So it's interesting, it's a bit of a vicious circle um, and anxiety. Um, and um, Rebecca will be able to understand this because there was a survey done in the States on um, veterans who were coming back from um, war zones and they were presenting with dry eye symptoms. And they were in these veterans hospitals, VA, and their eyes looked fine. And what they actually found out was that they had PTSD. 
and their PTSD was manifesting as dry eye symptoms. And this is why I was saying there's a difference between dry eye disease and dry eye symptoms. And if your dry eye is making you anxious, that tends to make your dry eye worse. And it, that's where you get this vicious circle, this awfully vicious circle. And so that's why you want someone who will listen to you. And interestingly, I had a patient a few weeks ago and he was describing something and, and his parent was in the room and they were describing their symptoms and the parent said something and the patient was like, you've got to stop gaslighting me. Uh, and I think Rebecca mentioned it earlier. Sometimes they, you know, it's difficult for people around you to understand the impact it's having on your life. But, you know, we will look at people and they will look structurally normal and we will have to have that difficult conversation with, well, potentially difficult, not for me. I'm, I'm, I'm trained, supposedly trained to have this conversation. And that conversation is, is have you spoken to anyone? We, you know, I would recommend that you have a conversation with your GP because part of what you are uh, feeling is coming from, not from physically coming from, from your eyes. There are potentially other elements to your, to your symptoms. And you have to have that honest conversation with the patient. And we would hope that patients who come to see us at least have an understanding of where they are and that we've not sent them away with no answers. You know, whether it's positive news, ideally, or maybe not so positive news in, in, in some cases. And I think understanding what, what's causing the problem can help relieve that anxiety because a big part of anxiety is just not knowing. So, I mean, when, when our patients leave, or particularly for dry eye assessment, we don't send them away. We do ask them to come back. Uh, we will see them in, in, in four weeks. Um, I know Scope have some, some fantastic resources and Rebecca's um, resource is fantastic. There, there, there are lots of things online which work really well. I get sometimes I, I worry a little bit about online um, resources. I think you have to look, you have to look at multiple sources when deciding what you're going to do, what's good for you and what isn't. The, the thing about dry eye disease and dry eye is that what works for someone won't necessarily work for someone else. So I, th I think Claire mentioned how IPL had been great for her and how it, how it really helped her. Whereas I saw, I, I don't know who it was, someone in the uh, Q&A said, well, I tried IPL, didn't work. And so it's very easy when you're within forums to get caught up in someone else's emotion and what has worked for them and what hasn't worked for them. So the forums are great. They're great for support, but sometimes look, look at other sources before you make a decision. Um, I would look at multiple sources before you make any decision about what you would try and what you wouldn't try. Um, you know, events like this are fantastic. Most of the dry eye stuff I do is, is clinician based. It's not actually having the patients drive the conversation because ultimately it is about them and, and how they can how they can help uh, to help themselves. 